a very good morning to all the doctors who are here and also those who are listening to us through our live uh, transmission. It's very heartening to see so many doctors in this hall, especially on Sunday morning. That gives us a lot of confidence to go ahead about especially and also shows the interest about the post-ADA update from Dr. Shashank Joshi, sir. So to introduce myself as uh, Dr. Swaroop, so I currently work as a senior medical manager for uh, No Nordisk India for obesity team. So on behalf of No Nordisk India and Indian Academy of Diabetics, I welcome you all for this prestigious post-ADA update under the guidance by Dr. Shashank Joshi, sir. So it gives me a great uh, honor to introduce Dr. Shashank Joshi, sir, though he does not need an introduction here for especially this group, but still I'll try to do my bit. So Dr. Shashank Joshi, sir, is a consultant, senior consultant endocrinologist at Leelawati Hospital and also a Joshi Clinic at Bandra West. He is currently the president of Indian Academy of Diabetes. He is the chair of IDF Southeast Asia. He is the past president of Endocrine Society of India. He is the past president of RSSDI. He is the past president of API and also Emirates, Emiratus editor of JAPI. He is the past president of IRO, that is All India Association for Advancement of Research in Obesity. He is an Indian chapter chair of American Association of Clinical Endocrinology. He is also a senior editor of Endocrine Connections. He has been awarded as International Clinicians of the Year in 2012 by AACE. He is also a recipient of a very prestigious award of Government of India, that is Padma Shri Awardee in 2014. Uh, so due to his recent travel to ADA, he could not, he been diagnosed as COVID positive, so he could not be here. Uh, but still, uh, uh, you know, he's committed to especially to deliver this post-ADA update uh, because of the interest level uh, among all. So he decided to do it virtual. So first of all, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Joshi, sir, uh, for coming virtual here. So now with that, uh, uh, we request uh, uh, you all to have the patience for next one to one and a half hours uh, to listen to Dr. Joshi, sir, to talk about the post-ADA update. So with that... Uh, I'll ask the organizers to go on virtual now. Thank you so much. So after the virtual session, so we will come back to the live uh, Q&A session. So you have an opportunity to directly ask any of your queries to Dr. Joshi, sir. So he'll be on live. Over to audience, organizers. morning everybody. Uh, today what we are going to do is uh, the recently concluded uh, American Diabetic Association 82nd scientific sessions <coughs> which was held at New Orleans in Louisiana uh, between the June of 3rd and 7th. Uh, we are going to take an overview of that and some of the key uh, lectures which are going to be presented. So we all know that this was a hybrid meeting. I was there physically. Uh, I'm back in India uh, physically. Uh, unfortunately, I did pick up a little bit of a COVID virus right away. Uh, we all 2022 is one of the first physical meetings after almost uh, two years uh, after the COVID pandemic. It had 130 speaker sessions, uh, five days of scientific deliberations, more than 1,000 plus original research presentations. Uh, what I'm going to overdo is give you some key award-winning lectures and insights on the science discuss around that. Uh, then look at the existing and emerging therapies, uh, some innovations which have happened at cutting-edge uh, therapeutics uh, in the space of diabetes management and a summary. So let us look at the award-winning lectures. Uh, the key award-winning lecture at the highlight of the conference every year uh, is the Banting Award lecture which uh, Francis Ashcroft from Oxford University gave on metabolic regulation of insulin secretion and health and disease. The Edward Bernman lecture was given by Gary F. Lewis on two decades of intestinal lipoprotein research, 
four big surprises and the Nobel Frankel Award lecture was given by Annie Ziang on diabetes in pregnancy for mothers and offsprings, a reflection of 30 years of clinical and translational research. Uh, the Banting Lecture 2022 was given virtually by Dr. Francis Ashcroft, uh, basically on metabolic regulation of insulin secretion in health and disease. And uh, this focused on a key receptor of the potassium channel in the beta cell. So we know that insulin secretion from beta cells, what is the missing link? And the missing link, uh, which uh, Ashraf, Harrison, and Ashcroft uh, published in Nature in 1984, is that a potassium channel closed by glucose and ATP is a seminal work which they showed uh, you know, way back in 1984. So we all know that the metabolic regulation of insulin secretion in health and disease uh, is, is a multi-step process. In a non-diabetic individual, the insulin is degranulated, but fundamentally we know that in the beta cells, when the glucose enters through the GLUT2 receptor, uh, it is metabolized and the, there is generation of ATP. And that ATP cassette, uh, which is uh, uh, potassium ATP channels, then shut off. There is a generation of an electrical activity, uh, which will eventually degranulate insulin. So this is the classical pathway. The glucose getting trapped through the GLUT2 uh, receptor, which generates an ATP, which shuts off the potassium channel, which generates an electrical charge, which will ensure that the preformed insulin uh, granules get degranulated. What happens in neonatal diabetes is that there are mutations which render the channels which are ATP insensitive and therefore the insulins do not get degranulated. So that's a typical form of the neonatal diabetes. And what happens in type 2 diabetes is that there is impaired ATP production. So again, there is no ATP for exocytosis of insulin when there is no calcium entry. So this is a seminal work of the potassium channels which Dr. Ashcroft did. So fundamentally, we all now know that in neonatal diabetes, it is linked to the gain of function ATP potassium channel mutations. These gain of function mutations in the potassium ATP channels cause 50% of cases with neonatal diabetes. And the incidence is one in 200,000 live births. We know that you get a marked hyperglycemia within the first six months of birth, low birth weight, most mutations occur spontaneously and mutations impair the ability of the magnesium ATP to close the potassium ATP channel. So fundamentally, the metabolism is high, but the potassium ATP channels shut the insulin secreted in a non-diabetic individual. But when there is a gain of function mutation, the metabolism is high, the potassium channels open, no insulin secretion, and then there is, of course, the development of neonatal diabetes. We also know that this has a therapeutic option. There are drugs like sulfonylureas, like liclazide, which close the potassium ATP channels and stimulate insulin secretion because that is the pathway through which they work. Here you can see before the drug therapy, the sugar is high or the glucose is high, potassium channels remain open, no insulin is secreted and beta cells are switched off. And after the administration of sulfonylurea drugs, the hyperglycemia settles down, sulfonylurea closes the sodium of potassium ATP channels and insulin is enabled. So fundamentally, there is a challenge which we see regularly in type 2 diabetes. Why do beta cells fail in type 2 diabetes? Again, the link to chronic hyperglycemia, which causes impaired metabolism and reduced ATP production, is linked to the inability of the potassium channels to fail to close. And exocytosis is also reduced by the low ATP generation. So targeting potassium ATP channel to induce diabetes has been another research area of Dr. Ashcroft's. And clearly you can see when there is an induction of the CUR 6.2 V59M gene in adult mouse beta cells, they cause diabetes. So clearly there is a link that the potassium channel switching off and switching on is linked to the insulin switching on and switching off, and it has a genomic potential. We also know that the beta cells don't die in diabetes. They lose their insulin content and change their metabolism. And fundamentally, in this experiment, you can very clearly see, which was published, that loss of insulin staining in diabetes does not necessarily mean loss of beta cells. Beta cell mass in type 2 diabetic islets may be underestimated if they are assessed by the insulin staining. 
The other thing with hyperglycemia, which is chronic in type 2 diabetes, is that glycogen is accumulated. And when there is glycogen accumulation, it suggests beta cell metabolism is hampered or impaired. So whenever there is an impairment of the beta cell metabolism due to glycogen accumulation, there is a membrane hyperpolarization. There is no electrical activity generated. And again, insulin is not degranulated. We also know that mano hepatolyse MH restores insulin secretion in chronic hyperglycemia. This is the data which is not published by their group, which clearly shows that if you have mannose heptylose, which is MH, and what is mannose heptylose? Basically, it is a, a modulator of glucokinase, which converts the glucose to glucose 6-phosphatase. And you can see MH or mannose heptylose restores the insulin secretion as illustrated in the graphic diagram. So can we stop or halt or reverse the progressive decline of beta cell function in type 2 diabetes? What we have learned over a couple of years now is sulfonylurea therapy with potassium ATP linked is to diabetes, neonatal diabetes is well established. There's a genomic link, secretagogues work, and neonatal diabetics does not need insulin. We also know that when we give intensive insulin therapy, you induce a concept called beta cell rest, and there is a resurrection of the date of decline of beta cell function. We also know from the direct trial and some data which we have shown in remission uh, that severe energy restriction, like 600 calories per day for more than eight weeks or more, can prevent the progressive decline of beta cell function. And even bariatric surgery, right from Podis et al. 30 years back on biliaropancreatic diversion, can also restore or prevent the progressive decline of beta cells. We also know that there is data to show that if there is partial glucokinase inhibition, it could be a treatment option as a novel diabetes therapy. Because when there is a partial glucokinase inhibition, there is the aim to re return the glucokinase flux to normal. You can see here the glucose and the GDPH and the glycogen storage and no insulin is being secreted, and the potassium channels are clearly linked to that. So partial glucokinase activation is there. So fundamentally, from that seminal talk of the Banting lecture, Professor Ashcroft and her group has shown that beta cells remain viable even after many years of diabetes. However, chronic hyperglycemia or chronic high blood glucose leads to the insulin degranulation and reduction of insulin content inside the beta cells, and the impairment of beta cell metabolism. And it is not glucose, but the glycolyte metabolite that causes the change like glycogen. So that was as far as the metabolic regulation of insulin secretion in health and disease. Let us look at two decades of intestinal lipoprotein research, the four big surprises. So the Edwin Berman Award lecture, he basically looked at uh, the uh, two decades of intestinal lipoprotein research. Gary F. Lewis from University of Toronto where insulin was discovered and is the director of the Banting and Best Diabetes Center delivered this talk. We clearly know that there is a link to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and all that is linked to the atherogenic diabetic dyslipidemic complex due to insulin resistance, excess free fatty acids and hyperglycemia. And that basically increases the triglyceride-rich lipoprotein pool, which will make the elevation of small, dense, sticky LDL and blunt or lower the HDL cholesterol. When you get generation of small, dense LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, and high generation of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, you get fundamentally formation of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So after two decades of intestinal lipoprotein research, there are four clear surprises which Dr. Gary described. The first, chylomicron production is increasing in insulin-resistant states and type 2 diabetes. Second, although fat ingested is a major determinant for chylomicron secretion, there is a complex multi-organ regulation of secretion that involves nutrients, hormones, and neural networks. Third, considerable amount of ingested lipid is retained in the gus postprandially, 
and in various lipid pools for many hours and later on is mobilized by various stimuli. Fourth, lymphatics may not just be passive conduits for chylomicron transport. Active regulation of lymphatic pumping may be an important site regulation in intestinal lipoprotein delivery to the blood circulation. So let us look at each one of them. We know that chylomicron production is increased in insulin resistant states and type 2 diabetes. So that's something which we all know very clearly. And the intestinal lipoprotein overproduction in insulin resistant hamster model has been very clearly illustrated here in this slide. The insulin resistant humans overproduce ApoB48 containing the intestinal lipoproteins. And fundamentally what you can see is that clear cut insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes leading to overproduction of atherogenic lipoproteins, namely the B100, VLDL, the B48 chylomicrons. And you get fasting and postprandial, not only hyperglycemia, but dyslipidemia, where there is excess triglycerides, excess ApoB100, excess ApoB48. The second fact is although fat is ingested as a major determinant of chylomicron secretion, there is a very complicated multi-organ regulation of nutrients, hormones, and neural networks. You can see whether it is the brain, the adipose tissue, the pancreas, the gut, or the liver, they have a modulation on VLDL and chylomicron. The lipoprotein secretion by the liver, which is the VLDL, and the intestine, which is the chylomicron, is modulated by the gut, the, uh, the pancreas, the adipose tissue, and the cellular signals from the brain. So fundamentally, we see that the regulation of intestinal and hepatic triglyceride-rich lipoprotein secretion, you can see <clears throat> the impact of dietary fats, the free fatty acids, impacting the uh, liver uh, uh, lipoprotein secretion, as well as the intestinal lipoprotein secretion. We also know that there are known potential normal factors regulating chylomicron secretion, whether it is diet, circulating factors, drugs or bariatric surgery, genomics, circadian regulation, gut microbiota, neural regulation of metabolic disorders. The third fact is that some ingested lipid is retained inside the gut postprandially in various lipid pools for many hours and gets mobilized a little later. So what happens is lipid is sequestrated as intracellular, the CLDs, inside the intestinal cells or enterocytes, as well as extracellularly secreted as chylomicrons in the intracellular space, lamina papria, and lymphatic circulation. In the animal models, triglyceride storage in enterocytes increases initially after fat stimulation and decreases over time. However, in humans, a significant pool of intracellular enterocyte lipid stores have been observed almost 10 hours to up to for 18 hours of lipids, which is mobilized in the gut from the post-dietary fat ingestion. So remember, fat stays stored in the gut for almost 18 hours, even after food consumption, and might have implications in health and disease. So here you can see that glucose ingestion mobilizes lipid stores from cytoplasmic lipid droplets in the intestinal enterocyte. So it has implications. Whenever there is glucose which is consumed, it mobilizes the stored lipids into the cytoplasmic lipid droplets in the intestinal enterocyte. So you can very, very clearly see the shift which is occurring here. And this is something very well recognized. Finally, lymphatics are not just passive conduits of chylomicron transports. You can see here on the diagram, very clearly that we have decreased chylomicron secretion on the left as evidenced by decreased lymphatic pumping, which is very clearly modulated with VEGFF, A and VEGFR in the blood vessels and lymphatic cells. And you can also see increased lymphatic pumping and increased chylomicron secretions modulated by APO4 and adrenomodulin. So clearly there is GLP-2 mobilization of intestinal lipids does not require a canonical enterocyte chylomicron synthetic machinery. GLP-1 antagonist attenuates the GLP-2 mediated effects in rats, and the GLP-2 receptor is not expressed in the enterocytes. The Golgi inhibition does not modulate the effects of GLP-2 on the lymph flow or the triglyceride concentration as well as the output. So clearly we now know that the GLP-2 lipid mobilizing effects 
we know that the GLP-2 stimulates chylomicron, does not acquire or require mobilization of intracellular lipid stores in human beings. We also know GLP-2 mobilizes mature chylomicrons, most likely residing in the lamina propria or intestinal lymphatics. We also know that the modulation of chylomicron is GLP-2 dependent and appears in humans without acting on the enterocytes directly. So GLP-2 bypasses the enterocyte storage of the lipid pool. So clearly you can see that this could lead to a novel anti-atherosclerotic treatment of dyslipidemia as an intestinal target sites beyond enterocytes to suppress chylomicrons. So these were the Banting lecture, the Edwin Berman lecture, which Gary Lewis gave. The next award-winning lecture was by Annie Ziang on a topic very, very pertinent. Diabetes in pregnancy for mothers and off offsprings, 30 years of clinical and translational research. And this is from the uh, Kaiser Permanente in South California. Clearly, we know worldwide prevalence of GDM has exponentially broken out. And it is particularly relevant to countries like Asia and India because the prevalence of GDM is highest in Asians or Pacific Islanders. And you can see this is the US database of a registry over the last decade. And clearly, you can see an exponential rise of gestational diabetes, almost to the percentage of 20% in the US population. In fact, this is data from more than 12 million first live births in the US with GDM on the birth certificate. You can see diabetes after GDM or risk of developing diabetes is associated with GDM is highest among the African-American community. So again, you can see here in the Kaplan-Meier curve that there is a clear cut relationship of a very high odds ratio of GDM developing as well as diabetes developing in people, especially in African-Americans. So if you look at race and ethnicity, clearly you can see that the Asia or Pacific Islanders have a very high incidence of gestational diabetes or diabetes in general, while diabetes incidence is highest in the African-Americans or the Blacks. It is intermediate for Hispanics, and it is low for the North Hispanic white population. Why is there a difference between GDM prevalence and diabetes incidence between the Asia-Pacific Islanders and the African-Americans? And this was hypothesized that the prevalence of GDM and subsequent diabetes may be the same in Hispanics and non-Hispanic uh, whites, women, but it may differ in the African-American or the black and the Asia-Pacific Islander woman. So what is the pathophysiology? And this is what she investigated, the pathophysiology of GDM in Hispanic women, which are similar to Indian women. What happens during GDM is that there are defects in the regulation of glucose clearance. How fast is the glucose cleared? There are defects in glucose production, and there are challenges in the clearance of free fatty acid concentrations. And the defects in glucose clearance, defects as, uh, as seen here by the radio labeled glucose, defects in the glucose production, as well as defects in the free fatty acids, they precede the development of type 2 diabetes in Hispanic women. Now, we know that when we can actually predict who with GDM will fail the beta cell. When we eat too much or there is excess caloric intake, there's a very fast decline of insulin secretion and beta cell components in Hispanic women compared to those who are at risk for type 2 diabetes. So clearly it is overwhelming now all over the world that if you eat too much, the insulin sensitivity is blunted and the beta cells get tired. The beta cells try to compensate and eventually they fail. So if you want to know who will fail the beta cells are the people who have excess high caloric intake. Clearly, you can see that if you want to prevent beta cell function and prevent diabetes, you need to treat insulin resistance and treat obesity. Here you can see from the DPP data or the tripod pipod data, targeting or treating obesity or targeting or treating insulin resistance can preserve beta cell function delay or prevent diabetes, whether it is the TZDs from the tripod or pipod trial, or whether it is an intensive lifestyle intervention from the DPP program. Clearly, the take-home message is GDM in mothers is clearly exponentially growing up. India is no exception. GDM has high risk in developing diabetes. 
there are racial and ethnic differences that we still need to do a lot of work, whether it is Asians like Indians, Pacific Islanders, Hispanics. What she observed in her cohort is in the Hispanic Americans, obesity is the prime driver. And when there is excess obesity and excess fat, it declines the beta cell compensation. There is high caloric activity, which may accelerate the decline. Physically active may protect beta cell function. And targeting obesity and insulin resistance may preserve beta cell function and delay or prevent diabetes. So what is the impact of GDM on the offspring? Because this was impact of GDM on the mother. What is the impact of GDM on the offspring? So clearly we know that pregnancy is a form of tissue culture. There is an abnormal nutrient mixture of maternal side which could disrupt fetal development and lead to short and long-term adverse health outcomes of offsprings. This is a classical fetal programming hypothesis which the Norbert Frankel gave in the Bantic lecture way back in 1980. So clearly we know the biological possibility that maternal diabetes leads to hyperglycemia in utero which leads to a state of inflammation, excess cytokines, oxidative stress and hypoxia, excess insulin and epigenomic changes which lead to adverse outcomes. And clearly you can see the highest risk of low, uh, you know, LGA or AGA status of infants born to the NHB woman. And clearly in this data, you can see very clearly that large for gestational age has a direct relationship. When we look at GDM on offsprings, the long-term health outcomes, and when their group assessed the spectrum of health outcomes, there is a sensitive window on sensitivity and severity of GDM. We clearly know that if the glucose is not well controlled, there are neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and ADHD, respiratory illnesses like asthma, the obesity which hampers growth trajectory, and mental health issues like anxiety and depression. So clearly GDM on autism risk, GDM as a whole is not associated with autism risk, but exposure to maternal GDM diagnosed at 26 weeks of gestation is associated with risk of autism spectrum disorders in the offspring. So in the offspring, clearly there is some link with, with autism. The types of diabetes and child's autism risk. The risk of offspring is elevated in mothers with type 1, type 2 and GDM diagnosed at 26 weeks of compared to no diabetes. So clearly whether you have type 1 diabetes, hazard ratio of 2.33, type 2 diabetes, hazard ratio of 1.39 and GDM diagnosed before 26 weeks, hazard ratio of 1.26, after 26 weeks, hazard ratio of 0.98. Clearly there is a risk for autism. The A1C in the first trimester and child's autism risk, the better is the A1C, lesser are the chances of the child's autism risk. So maternal glycemic control in early pregnancy is very, very important for the autism development risk. So if you have to treat during pregnancy, hit hard, hit early, use insulin if required, give aggressive MNT, because if you do not do that, you will ultimately lead to long-term outcomes for the child, including autism. It is not just autism which is important. So GDM directly is not associated as a whole with attention deficit uh, disorder. Clearly, there is data now to show that severity of maternal diabetes, type 1 versus type 2 or GDM, which needs anti-diabetic medicines, influences the risk of attention deficit hyperactivity disorders in offsprings of mothers with diabetes. So clear data is there. <clears throat> what about childhood asthma? Risk of childhood asthma is predominantly observed in exposure to pre-existing type 2 diabetes and GDM requiring medications. So if the GDM needs medicines, there is pre-existing type 2 diabetes, the likelihood of childhood asthma goes up. We also know there is a hierarchical BMI pattern of different types of diabetes starting from the age of 3 years. And clearly you can see the potential teratology. So clearly you can see the potential long-term effects upon the fetus of altered interactions of maternal fuels during pregnancy. So any change during the pregnancy in the maternal fuel will have not only a long-term impact on the fetus, or later on even on the child which is developed. So clearly the take-home messages are simple, that hyperglycemia during pregnancy affects a broad spectrum of long-term health outcomes in offsprings, both high to low, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. GDM diagnosing early or requiring medications have also uh, impact 
and little risk of GDM is developed late and not requiring medications. More degree of glycemic control and timing of exposure matter on the out offspring outcomes. For future research, the thoughts are the degree of glycemic control of the pregnancy and the risk of offspring. Clearly, this relationship needs to be studied better. Can we better help women with glucose under control during pregnancy? So keeping glucose under control in pregnancy is vital, whether you are GDM or not GDM. And can early screening or uh, during planning help? And clearly, there are racial and ethnic differences. And we know India is one of the highest prevalence of gestational diabetes. So these were the award-winning lectures. Let us look at existing and emerging therapies at ADA before we move on to the innovation space. So clearly, the, the hottest uh, block of the table is the future of insulin, a weekly, oral, smart, or interchangeable therapies. So let us look at the once a week insulin, which is coming up. I think probably it is still the hottest of the block in San Francisco, where the last physical ADA was held. And uh, this physical ADA at New Orleans, really this has been on the spotlight. So what happened in the last two years, let us look at that. And then of course, we'll look at other, our, other evidences as they come about. So future of insulin, is it weekly? Is it oral? Is it smart? Is it interchangeable? Well, weekly insulin is on the horizon. And there is some excellent data, including data being generated in India. The pill to swallow is oral insulin, still an uh, enigma. And making insulin smarter or glucose-sensitive insulin, also some emerging areas and data presented at the ADA. So once a week, insulin in development currently are two. The ICODAC by Novo Nordisk and the BIF LY3200-9590 by Eli Lilly. Both are in phase three of development. We know the ICODAC by Novo Nordisk is acylation with the eicosodenic acid, which prolongs the half-life, and the BIF compound is the FC fusion protein. <clears throat> the other compounds, like the pegylated microscope delivery or the uh, EPL phylation, the isobra, both the projects did not make the light and are abandoned. There are another three uh, FC fusion-based proteins from Ascon Biosensis, Astra, and Hemi, which are also trying to look at preclinical of phase one in the once a week insulins. Currently, what is closest uh, are the two which we are mentioned above. So the basal insulin once a week appears to be a reality. What does it be made up of? So we are going to have the insulin Ephistora alpha INN as well as the uh, uh, LY BIF protein. So basically, we know that a single chain of insulin, that is the insulin B analog, has a short peptide linker and an insulin A chain analog. Fused to the human Ig2FC region, it can increase the half-life. And therefore, there is a BIF phase 3 program of twin 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 with glargine, degludec, glargine, MDI and type 1 diabetes. And then, of course, we have the latest kid of the block, which is the ICODAC. I did present data two years back on ICODAC when it was introduced on the onwards program, onward 1 to onward 6. This ICODAC insulin is nothing but there are three amino acid substitutions on the molecular stability, enzymatic degradation, and reduced receptor-mediated clearance. The C20 icosane fatty diacid has a strong reversible binding to albumin and reduces the receptor-mediated clearance. The ICODAC programs of phase 3A, now because it's an advanced phase 3A, are once a week onwards 1, onwards 2, which is basal switch, onwards 3, which is insulin 9 with type 2 diabetes, onwards 5, which is RCT with real-world elements, onwards 4, which is basal bolus, and onwards 6, which is basal bolus in type 1 diabetes. So ICODAC is superior to degludec. So when you switch from daily basal insulin in type 2 diabetes to an ICODAC insulin, which was seen in onwards 1 as well as onwards 6, you can see there's no statistical significant difference in the hypoglycemic rate. So you have something coming up now, which is once a week insulin. Do we have something oral? Well, lot of challenges developing oral insulins. Dan Drucker put out this very nice paper 
of various ways how gastrointestinal enzymes acidic ph and various intracellular enterocytes hamper the development of oral peptides different types of oral absorptions with nanoparticles so gastrointestinal tracts were being developed whether it is a liposome a lipid based mechel a polymer nanoparticle a silica nanoparticle a metallic organic framework these are all things we know that india has a tragopil story it is ultra fast short acting insulin it's a pegylated recombinant human insulin it's short uh, uh, compound it has a open label study and it does show improvement in one hr ppg and overall ppg control oramed is another solution for oral insulin entry coated with protease inhibitor with an absorption inhibitor and you can see that it is another solution which is coming in but still it is not finishing the line so whether it is a tragopil story or the oramed story they are still not finishing the line as far as the oral insulin is concerned so really the focus beyond one cervix insulin now is to make insulin smarter which is glucose sensitive insulin and making insulin smarter has clinical goals reduce the risk of hypoglycemia mean glycemic control reduce glycemic variability enhanced adherence quality of life and so on and so forth so classes of glucose responsive insulins are different one mechanical cgm coupled and closed loop systems second polymer based which is glucose responsive lectins and matrices third is bio inspired carriers through albumin and gut channels fourth is metabolic clearance through mannose receptors and finally the unimolecular gri which are still not in public domain so clearly when we are looking at glucose sensitive insulin you have a lot of compartmental models which are trying to look at a signature glucose responsiveness with gri therapy so this is something work in progress so clearly when it comes to the smart or glucose sensitive insulins there is a reversible binding of glucose to gri snap locks the receptor to active signaling conformations the signaling of glucose dependent cells and cell cultures will keep the insulin regulated range between 100 to 200 mg of glucose and in silico models show that it can predict mit parmea model for optimizing to switch compatibility and scale manufacturability so clearly there is a lot happening in the glucose sensitive insulin space what about obesity diabetes that's the next big thing and and dada and that was what was presented so there was a very nice debate weighing evidence should obesity be the prime target of treatment of type 2 diabetes and one of my mentors looked at it very closely should it be weight loss versus glucose control lidi lingue versus jeffrey mechanic so pro obesity be the primary target of treatment of type 2 diabetes well here you can see weight loss as a primary target bmi about 30 kg bmi below 25 kg and you can see here that adipose driven conditions are the ones which which lead to challenges so if you look at cardio metabolic based chronic conditions you can see her the different risk staging which has been seen you can see her that people at risk pre diabetes disease complications you can have a weight pathway where there could be body weight which is increase body composition which is abnormal body function which is abnormal and there could be a bmi threshold which could lead to obesity anthropometric threshold biochemical threshold and ultimately this condition will lead to cardio metabolic and biomechanical complications and then of course we have the glucocentric vision of insulin resistance pre diabetes type 2 diabetes with macro and microvascular disease so there is a entity called adipose pathi and adipose pathi bmi is a very poor measure of individuals adipose related disease and this is most illustrated in india because we are thin fat indians it is the fat quantity quality and location all three which matters so it is best to avoid the term obesity and use the term adis adiposopathy adis adiposopathy is a key pathogenic driver for many conditions it represents a disease continuum and the goals and treatments differ from different stages so there is evidence now to show that if you do weight loss it impacts type 2 diabetes both from intensive lifestyle intervention as well as which we have seen in the lucai trial 
as well as impact from the bariatric surgery. And both have shown the cardiovascular and the glucose outcomes are seen with sustained weight loss. We also know that weight loss causes remission for type 2 diabetes. When there is weight loss more than 10% of body weight, with shorter duration of diabetes, less than 5 to 8 years, there is remission of diabetes in many studies. Means inducing weight loss is less important as weight loss can be sustained. Amount of weight loss is seen across the life saving disease continuum and outcome depends on the starting stage. So remember, holistic approach to type 2 diabetes management and patient-centric approach is equally important. So currently, we have multiple approaches. It could be patient-centric, weight-centric, glucocentric, cardiocentric. Because it is a marriage of type 2 diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. And therefore, one has to be weight-centric, cardiocentric, and glucocentric. Which proportion of type 2 diabetes needs weight-centric approach more than the glucocentric approach? Which part will need a cardiocentric approach more than the weight-centric approach needs a lot of individualization. So balance of the key is success. For example, with weight loss, you get good metabolic control, resolution of diabetes, blood pressure, lipids, fatty liver, inflammation, cardiovascular disease, improved mechanics of osteoarthritis, obstructive sleep apnea, GRD, improved quality of life and self-esteem. But the drawbacks are gallbladder disease, sudden weight loss can cause gallbladder disease or aggravation of pre-existing biliary sludge, sarcopenia, bone loss and fragility fractures, surgical complications, micronutrient deficiencies, as well as dumping syndromes, drug-specific adverse events, and cost and distress. So conceptual proposal is a adiposity-related diabetes. Consider independently a baseline A1C or individual's A1C target. Initiate lifestyle modification and anti-obesity pharmacotherapy. If weight loss goals are not met, consider switching or adding anti-obesity agents. And still they are not met, then look at bariatric surgery. And now we have very good weight-sparing glucose-lowering medications. It's not metformin alone or AGLT2 alone. We have now oral GLP-1 receptor agents, not just injectable GLP-1 receptor agents, which have clearly been the game changers. And we know injectable GLP-1 receptor agents, whether it is liraglutide or semaglutide or oral semaglutide, are not only approved now for diabetes, but also approved for obesity. So can glucose or should glucose be the primary target of treatment of type 2 diabetes was a contrarian debate. So that was the, the weight loss approach of it, the, 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 the barycentric approach of it. Now we'll move into the glucocentric approach which Jeffrey Mechanics said. Well, the targets need not be mutually as exclusive. We can manage weight and glucose together. The best way to manage individual patients with type 2 diabetes is glucose control is necessary, but is not sufficient or primary targets in patients with type 2 diabetes to prevent or development of chronic complications. So answer boils down to pathophysiology and evidence. So the optimal type 2 diabetes care is individualized with three-dimensional cardiometabolic-based chronic disease prevention care model. It depends on the stage of the disease, the key mechanistic drivers, and the social determinants of health and transcultural factors. So remember how things happen. The things happen basically because there's a driver-based chronic disease model of excess adiposity, dysglycemia, and cardiometabolic risk. Adiposity and dysglycemia, along with other cardiometabolic risk factors, are key mechanistic drivers in cardiovascular disease and number one cause of worldwide mortality. So therefore, addition of weight control, glucose control is a primary target in comprehensive care with type 2 diabetes. Because in the stage 3 dysglycemia-based chronic disease, it is very important to prevent or mitigate diabetes complications, especially heart disease. It's important not just to control weight, but it's equally important to control the glucose. So the counter argument is obesity should be the primary target for treatment of type 2 diabetes. The flaw one is obesity is stage 3, stage 4 adiposity-based chronic disease is currently defined by BMI and not based on lower amounts of overweight of ectopic or visceral fat or adipokine signature. So that's the first flaw of the barycentric approach. And therefore, we still need the glucocentric approach and barycentric approach to go hand in hand. That's what Professor Jeffrey Mechanic argued. The second flaw is obesity exerts adverse metabolic effects through insulin resistance, which generally leads to beta cell defects in hyperglycemia, impelling that cardiometabolic outcome-based chronic disease 
which requires comprehensive care and not just obesity care. So clearly obesity is not just about weight loss. Simple weight loss will not get you remission. Simple weight loss is not sufficient. Simple weight loss and obesity is linked to BMI, is linked, not, need not be linked to cardio or metabolic health. So it's very, very important to look at glucose as well. The third flaw is not all patients with type 2 diabetes have obesity or even adiposity. We see that in India quite often. For fourth flaw is obesity and hyperglycemia are not mutually exclusive. They often go hand in hand. We know that ABCD, which is the adiposity-based chronic disease, stage three, stage four, it's a chronic, chronic, uh, complex uh, disease with multiple drivers, and that is something very important. The fifth flaw is superior weight control over glucose and type two diabetes is not established, and finally, therefore, the counter arguments are flawed and should be rejected. So the arguments are that the better primary targets in type 2 diabetes are obesity or hyperglycemia. The proposal is glucose is always the primary target with patients with severe hyperglycemia, mild obesity, high risk of hyperglycemia related microvascular complications than obesity related complications, which is a complication centric approach. So the rationale is to reduce the risk of complications depending on the dominant driver using an ABCD model, DBCD model, CMBCD model, which is hyperglycemia versus adiposity. So the refined proposal is hyperglycemia should be prioritized above obesity in patients with dysglycemia-based chronic disease model, stage 3 and stage 4, and ABCD model above 1, 2, and 3, or CMBCD model above 4, 3, 2, and 1. So clearly you can see in this slide, whether it is the microvascular complications, Markers of glucose control, blood pressure, nitrogen balance were associated with microvascular risk with type 2 diabetes. And increased BMI was not associated with microvascular complications. So if you look at the good versus bad, stipulate good means high likelihood of prevention of progression of complications of type 2 diabetes, whether it's microvascular or cardiovascular. Control of glucose is good because then the cardiovascular and microvascular complications can be halted. Control of obesity is good and that contextualization should continue. So clearly you can see the different drivers have to be attacked at different stage, whether 1D, 2D, 3D, and glucose should be kept as a primary target. So you can't ignore glucose as a primary target. Obesity also can be kept as a primary target. And we can combine glucose and obesity as a primary target. So remember, glucose control should always be the primary target in type 2 diabetes. We cannot give it up but it is not sufficient. So therefore, we need to have a 3D approach of cardiometabolic-based chronic disease, which concedes that primary target is important that beyond glucose, look at fat loss. And therefore, it's important to recognize both inappropriately. This was a very hotly debated trial, okay, which is a Sarmont 1 trial. And then I'm going to present something which I presented on the RCT, a small RCT on the remission. Sarmont 1 came in as probably one of the hottest spots of the ADA. It was a result of phase 3 obesity trial with GIP, GLP-1 receptor agent, terzapatide. We all know terzapatide is a 39 amino acid synthetic peptide, C20 fatty acid dimer. It's a single molecule possessing two molecular targets, GLP-1 and GIP. And we all know the GLP-1 receptor agonism very well. We also know the GIP receptor agonism very well. Both of them can impact central nervous system, pancreas, stomach, adipose tissue, and energy kinetics. And there is a dual agent now. And this was the trial which was used uh, of surmount 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you can see here in the surmount 1, the data which was presented as RCT and published also during the ADA in the trial design picked up adults with 18 years of age with obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obstructive sleep apnea, or CVD, and history of one or more unsuccessful diet or weight loss program. They excluded diabetics and change of body weight, which was sudden, or endocrine obesity. And they looked at body weight composition. And you can see the weight reduction is very, very impressive. So some very, very impressive weight loss, which was seen, both waist loss as well as you can see a percentage of fat mass 
which was proportionately more compared to the total body lean mass. And you can see the waist kinetics, A1C, blood pressure also coming down very well. But the GI was the only side effect. 21% of them were linked uh, uh, to COVID also. And they were transient, uh, usually linked to dose escalation. And uh, there's hardly any other major adverse event ap apart from the gallbladder disease. So that's something which we know. So terzapatide was very good for weight loss, looks very, very impressive, and it worked in progress. We did a trial on uh, a digital twin technology with six months of, of the trial, and that we presented the metabolic benefits beyond glycemic control. I had an oral presentation on Friday, uh, on the uh, third, uh, with artificial intelligence, internet of things, uh, with six months on an RCT from the Indian population. And we all know that this is something which is now coming up as artificial intelligence in a big way. It was an interventional trial from four centers in India. Uh, it's an ongoing trial. We presented the data. What it does is basically, what is this whole body digital twin? It picks up all the signals from glucose on sensor data, blood data, medicine data, behavior data. The signals are now analyzed by artificial intelligence. And precision guidance through a coach and supervised by a doctor is given on nutritional modulation sleep, activity, breathing patterns, happiness, and medications. And you can see it very clearly, A1C came down by 3%, blood pressure, weight, BMI, waist circumference, lipids, visceral adiposity index, fatty liver, uh, uh, you know, inflammation, AVCAD all dropped. And 83.9% of people achieved remission. You can see the A1C dropped, the various metabolic markers which dropped, the adiposity which, which dropped uh, very significantly. And you can see that these are some compelling results uh, of a non-ingredient AI-based coach-directed medical supervised intervention, which showed in a RCT format that you can get uh, uh, diabetes remission. You can have people off type 2 diabetes medications and complication freeze. We need to do long-term data on the same. And uh, we, we did have uh, similar presentations on both glycemic and extra glycemic parameters uh, on the same, which was a late breaker abstract. And uh, that's that's what we are looking at. Let us look at the recent innovations. Uh, in the recent innovations, we know that the once a week insulin, uh, uh, Icodec, had a lot of data presented at ADA 2020. Here is data which is presented by Thomas Pieper et al. Uh, with the known orders team, uh, clearly showing hypoglycemia frequency and physiological response on double and triple doses or once a uh, week Icodec versus once a day uh, insulin glargine. And they looked at hypoglycemia frequency after uh, double and triple doses. So basically looked at the physiological response to hypoglycemia after triple dose in individuals with plasma glucose below 54 uh, with or without hypoglycemia symptoms. So this was a trial design, randomized open label two period crossover trial because this was a safety data trial double dose and triple dose. You can see uh, Icodac as well as Glargine. So it was clinically significant hyper hypoglycemia uh, in both the groups. And of course, you can see the achievement of target nadir plasma glucose uh, as well as the mean nadir plasma glucose and the counter-regulatory hormonal response of the adrenaline and noradrenaline. And you can see that the response was far more robust and superior with the once a week Icodac compared to the standard Glargine. So you now can see clearly that in times to come in a year or two, we will have a once a week insulin, which will be a reality. And this will truly be a game changer in, in the market space. And the counter-regulatory hormones, whether it is not adrenaline, uh, noradrenaline, cortisol or growth hormone, they are very comparable or better. So clearly you can see head to head in double dose or triple dose, clinically significant hypoglycemia, is comparable of Icodac versus Glargine. Physiological response to hypoglycemia after triple dose, again, with Icodac is comparable. In fact, the response, the counter-regulatory response is better with Icodac. And there's comparable glucagon and growth hormone response of Icodac with Glargine. No safety issues, no severe hypoglycemic episodes during the treatment periods. So you can give it once a week and switch off. So there's really no need to concern. A lot of us have these doubts. You know, when I, when I saw this molecule three years back, I had this doubt. But I think this, this data very clearly supports the connotation that they, that day of doubt is completely unfounded. So clearly, once a week, insulin icodac uh, at double or triple doses does not lead to hypoglycemia compared to once 
a daily uh, insulin glycine at double and triple doses. During hypoglycemia also, there is a very, very good symptomatic response and a moderately greater endocrine response seen with Icodec. So it's a much more physiological uh, response compared to the glycine. Pioneer 8 data was presented at DADA on the insulin sparing effects of oral semaglutide, the analysis. And uh, Vandita Arora from the United States presented that data. The Pioneer 8 trial is a 52 week double blind placebo controlled trial, which is with uh, uh, semaglutide 3, 7, and 14 versus the placebo. And clearly, you can see the methods here. The 20% insulin reduction was recommended after randomization. And uh, the uh, sex matched, age, race, body weight, BMI, A1C, and mean insulin dose has been looked at. And the proportion of patients achieving reduction from total insulin dose from baseline at 26 weeks and 52 weeks is substantial with oral semaglutide. And you can see the people achieving A1C below 7% is also substantial with oral semaglutide. And proportion of patients on insulin without any weight gain also is substantial with no hypoglycemic uh, events is more than 80%. And percentage of people achieving insulin reduction of more than 20% is almost to the tune of 30%. And the large proportion of people achieve an A1C below 7%, no weight gain, no hypoglycemia, and did a reduction of more than 20% on the insulin doses. So clearly, Pioneer 8 trial shows us, presented at the ADA, the treatment with oral semaglutide is an enabler to reduce total insulin dose without compromising glucose control and optimal weight gain and potential of hypoglycemia. And larger number of people achieve insulin reduction of 20% with oral semaglutide. The greatest dose reductions are possible. De-intensification or de-escalation is possible. And addition of semaglutide in type 2 diabetics clearly now gives us an option to reduce insulin dose in a big way. Are there real-world A1C changes and prescribe or provider in type 2 diabetes initiating treatment with oral semaglutide. Well, uh, Monica Fraser and the group presented this data of the real world A1C changes and the prescribing providing uh, the types of treatment. You can again see here that above 9% A1C with uh, semaglutide, very clear data. The A1C is sustainability dropping. If there's uncontrolled A1C, you can clearly see a drop of the uh, uh, the uh, uh, A1C with semaglutide. So it's very persistent, and this is very, very compelling. So these results show us that oral semaglutide is very effective in type 2 diabetes treatment in the real world, in uncontrolled A1C. In fact, I'm using this now regularly, that if you have uncontrolled A1C in the real world with type 2 diabetes, here is again a reinforcement of the same data, and the initial dose of semaglutide appeared higher in prescribing instructions uh, in more than half of study patients and in primary care positions, uh, patients uh, oral semaglutide was prescribed their endocrinologist and more research is re required to understand the provider speciality. 2.4 milligram of semaglutide reduced 10 year uh, type 2 diabetes risk in people with overweight and obesity. Let us look at that data. Timothy Gravy presented that data from Birmingham, Alagama. And this is very, very important. It was a poster presentation of uh, 2.4 milligram semaglutide using a 10-year type 2 diabetic risk in overweight and obesity. So how does semaglutide alter the CMDS risk score? And we all know the cardiometabolic disease scoring is a validated tool to type 2 diabetic risk assessment over 10 years. And you can clearly see that they, this uh, tool was applied for a post Hawk step one, step four trials analysis with once a week semaglutide. And you can here clearly see the step one and step four trial designs of once a week 2.4 milligram of semaglutide. And you can clearly see the robust weight loss. This is so compelling, the robust weight loss which we see with semaglutide. And clearly you can see the CMDS score, which is the percentage of risk developing type 2 diabetes over the next 10 years. Because you know the CMDS score is much more well developed in regards of population and the ARIC population, as well as is better than the risk of the Framingham risk, the ADA risk, and the ATP3 risk predicting type 2 diabetes. So it's a much more holistic score. And here you can see whether it is step 1 or step 2, the overall 10-year type 2 diabetic risks overall in all populations 
is substantially reduced. The glycemic, normal glycemia and pre-diabetes changes is again very, very robust. The overall risk scores are excellent. And here you can see that the change of 10-year type 2 diabetic risk scores relative to the baseline scores is statistically significant with some other diet. So clearly there's a 60% of reduction with 10-year risk of type 2 diabetes treatment with once a week semaglutide. Very effective with normal glycemia and pre-diabetes and sustained semaglutide treatment can be needed. So we cannot stop it. And it's going to be a standard of care for type 2 diabetes in overweight and obesity. Finally, let us look at type 1 diabetes and evolve study. This is a study of safety and effectiveness of ASPART compared to other bolus insulins with pre-existing type 1 diabetes during pregnancy. So does ASPART matter in pregnancy? And Liz Bethison presented this data and she looked at and her group looked at in the EVOLVE protocol. And this was a no uh, sponsored study. This was an oral presentation. And you can clearly see that as part in a post hoc analysis, it is prospective multinational cohort study they looked at as part very closely in 1840 pregnant women with type 2 diabetes at conception. In 15 EU countries, Israel and Malaysia, where they looked at as part versus basal insulin, other bolus insulins versus basal insulin. And they looked at endpoints like major congenital malformations, prenatal death, neonatal death, and major uh, secondary endpoints like maternal hypoglycemia, preeclampsia A1C, and pregnancy outcomes like abortion, preterm delivery, and uh, LGA, or large for gestational age at birth. And they looked at standard statistics. And clearly you can see that risk of major congenital malformations, perinatal or neonatal death with ASPAR versus other bolus insulins was completely comparable. So no, no issues there. It was comparable on major hypoglycemia, abortion, preterm delivery, preeclampsia, and LGA. And A1C was identical may be significantly lower A1Cs were observed in the third trimester with S part. So you could see small little delineation which occurred at separation of course. So clearly you can see that, you know, even in type 1 diabetes in pregnancy, addition of an analog like S part clearly is not going to impact your malformations, maternal or offspring complications, However, lower mean A1C values are observed, particularly in the third trimester, which is so compelling for outcomes. So I think ESPART is a safe, effective bolus insulin during pregnancy with a small risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes compared to other bolus insulin. So clearly you can see there's an advantage coming up. This is the last part of my presentation. On the last day of Tuesday and then coming up at Stockholm in ESD, they are going to do a joint ADA ESD management algorithm for hypoglycemia with type 2 diabetes. There's so many new advances coming in. You can see that this algorithm needs to change. This decision cycle is a patient-centric management approach, which ADA ESD guidelines have set. And it's all about assessing the person living with type 2 diabetes. The current lifestyle, the health behavior, the comorbidity, whether it's cardiovascular risk, renal risk, heart failure risk, age, A1C or weight, then, of course, is the SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-limited, and then keep on reviewing it. So this is the standard goals of care, prevent complications, optimize quality of life. And fundamentally, with the old update, new evidence has come in. For example, there is primary evidence from cardiovascular outcome trials like Amplitude O, Vertis CV, Freedom CVO, Heart failure trials like DAPA HF, Solist VHF, Emperor Reduce, Emperor Preserve, renal outcome trials like DAPA CKD and SCORE, secondary evidence like para pairwise meta analysis and synthetic group sub analysis, and comparative effectiveness of network meta analysis. So now it's all going to a holistic person centric approach to type 2 diabetes management. It's getting more on precision medicine now. So they really change that goals of care. And this is the new mantra now at ADASD, that it is glycemic management, weight management, cardiovascular risk factor management, cardiorenal protection. So it is glucose, weight, 
cardiovascular risk factors and cardio renal protection so the four big mantras of the holistic patient centric type 2 diabetes approach for the adhd is control glucose manage weight manage cardiovascular risk and do cardio renal protection and in this space probably taking into account all the four considerations probably agents like semaglutide come up right on the pecking order hgl2 inhibitors follow them but the data is most compelling in the weight space and cardio risk uh, vascular risk factor management space for the glp1 analogs oral and injectable followed by the hgl2 inhibitors and we need to ensure that we need to look at aggressive combination therapy if they want to see is at target even in the beginning beyond metformin particularly with high cardiovascular risks so clearly we need to also look at a weight management approach and we need to ensure that we need to look at medical weight loss we need to have a structured evidence based weight management program we also need to look at remission in a big way but in the approach of the cardio metabolic risk factors cardio metabolic risk factor screening blood pressure lowering lipid lowering anti thrombotic agents smoking cessation is equally important in the ckd space or the cardio renal space we definitely need to look at the hgl2s as well as in the atherosclerotic risk indicator states and heart failure space we need to look at that in the bigger way so clearly we have a glucose centric approach a weight centric approach a cardiovascular risk management approach and a cardio renal approach and all these four quadrant form the new ada esd algorithm which was released on tuesday the 7th just this week in the ada of new orleans and ultimately the algorithm has remained the same but in the pecking order you can see clearly that glp1 receptor agents and hgl2 inhibitors are right up there in the pecking order so the key takeaways of the uh, 2022 ada esd report is glp1 receptor agents and hgl2 inhibitors are the first line independent of metformin for individuals with type 2 diabetes with established atherosclerotic vascular disease or with multiple cardiovascular risk factors clear cut data number 2 weight management in diabetes is never been so useful with outcome data as has been seen now and is as important to target with similar weight as glycemia so there is equal weightage to weight and glucose both losing fat is as important as lowering glucose i think that's the second overarching theme and that also was a theme of ada third is early combination is a need of the hour and don't hesitate to use agents early whether it is using an agent like a oral semaglutide you, you can use it early or an hgl2 inhibitor or any other agent use hit hard hit early look at cardio renal risk with glucose and weight management issues with equal weightage and individualized glycemic treatment has not changed uh, uh, but has not accepted 5.7% as a new glycemic target summarizing all the points well as i said that the ada banting lecture was on glucokinase inhibition and that could appear as a novel diabetes therapy particularly on the potassium channels and it may have an impact on reducing disease progression because secretor gogs can be re 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 requisitioned with them the glp2 is an important chylomicron modulator without acting on the enterocytes directly as a novel anti atherosclerotic treatment for dyslipidemia that's the second thing we learned we need to have a balanced approach between weight control and glucose control as a primary target in type 2 diabetes we are getting some very very aggressive weight loss agents like tazapatide uh, which might be very very impressive in the future but we need to see safety data from them clearly once a week insulin is doable and is available and will be available in times to come with some excellent data data on oral semaglutide continues with insulin sparing impact and we clearly see without hypoglycemia and the real world impact data of semaglutide is also impressive as well as the injectable semaglutide on the 10 year risk of people with overweight and obesity and insulin as part can be safe in pregnancy is some data which is showing thank you for a patient hearing thank you so much uh, uh, dr joshi sir for providing that uh, 
uh, the five days session in a very brief, in a one hour of, uh, you know, the entire gist of ADA, uh, five days, you could able to provide it in just one hour. So I think uh, nobody else can do it. So can we have a big round of applause to Dr. Choshi, sir? So now, uh, moving ahead, uh, we do have an opportunity uh, for a Q and A. So, uh, do we have Sir online now? Yes. So uh, the audience can directly ask uh, questions uh, to Dr. Joshi, sir. So, uh, can we provide the mics, sir? Can you hear us, sir? Sir, uh, am I audible? Sir, can you hear me? Uh, technical team, can you please check? Sir, you're on mute, sir. Sir, can you hear me, sir, if you can confirm? Maybe questions? Yes, sir. Now, um, now are we audible? Uh, am I audible, sir, now? Yes, sir. I'm just trying with the technical team. So, what about now, sir? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now, sir? Nirud, can you please check? Yeah. Can you hear us? Okay. I'm just trying to... His voice is audible. Ah, he's just asking the phone. You mentioned somewhere that uh, the real world evidence showed that the oral SEMA starting doses were no higher than the doses which were there in literature. So is a preferable dose 7 milligram instead of 3 for the oral SEMAs? Is that what we were trying to prove there? Or do we start with 3 and then escalate? Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Uh, the, the debate on the obesity versus hyperglycemia. 
what you personally feel obesity is more important or the hyperglycemia and with this newer agents like terpizide is coming do you think the future of the obesity management will completely change in our country ट because its safety data is better so that is known to us resapatide is still an unknown entity for me uh, though the weight loss which it achieved was very impressive i must confess that but it's still injectable and we don't know the adverse events hello yeah sir uh, practically practically when, when we use glp1 agonist we find that weekly dilat diraglutide uh, was we were very comfortable using it as a weekly injection so why not we have a semaglutide weekly injection simultaneously for people who are have mindset mind block like in the other that's a different story but uh, weekly injection is a very very practically feasible uh, point as i would say so fair point doctor i would love to have seven uh, uh, 2.4 mg uh, uh, mg of uh, ozempic or semaglutide and i would i wish that no more also injectable semaglutide as well here in india I completely agree with you. So there is a group of patients who do not like to take the oral compound, and would love, love to take a once a week compound. In the US, it is very popular. So I, I am with you there. Doctor Shashank, this is Doctor Navin Chandra. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Uh, your summary showed first point is that uh, sulfonyl ureas have been stressed again. See, we have been seeing a lot of uh, these seminars in which sulfonyl ureas are supposed to be dumped. What so what do you have to say, say now? That no, no, no. this is in the space. This is in the space of uh, potassium channels of neonatal diabetes. It's a very small indication, like Moody. So that, that is a very small, not in type of diabetes. So in the banting lecture, when I started my talk, I started with the banting lecture. So the lady from Oxford who presented the data, Dr. Ashcroft, she presented her work. Who, who she discovered the potassium. Uh, uh, ATP channel receptors, and, and uh, they basically are the ones through which the sulfonylurea act. So in that subset of diabetes, uh, we saw that uh, this was uh, a very important thing. And, and the other thing is that now sulfonylurea in the Western world, in the Western world, the sulfonylurea are almost a part of it. So nobody uses them there. and the other thing is that uh, is it time for us to dump metformin the cheapest medicine no no metformin is evergreen see, it will always stay see because everywhere it is being shown that uh, one should start with glp1 uh, uh, no 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 receptor agonist and gl as a as after metformin next so either it is glp1 or glp2 is only after metformin uh, people with high cardiovascular risk cardiologists in europe I uh, prefer GLP-1 over metformin, but metformin is still the gold standard according to the all the guidelines. Nowhere has metformin been replaced. So I agree with you that the data on that is very poor. And the other thing is, semaglutide injectable is still available only as one milligram in US, not 2.4. Correct, but that is a dose which they have used for most of the trials. No, but they have used 2.4 as you showed that uh, 10-year. Uh, Correct. So why not uh, have that uh, also 2.4 milligram instead of only one milligram? That 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 is a company for. Hello. For them, they have one milligram pen. What is available there? Something is available as one milligram, two milligram, point five milligram. That is also available in the US. But for trial purposes, they are using a different thing. Their pen is a one milligram pen in the US. You are right. It's a pre-print pen. Okay. But unfortunately, it is not available here. They have starter pen. Hello, hello, Sashank. 
Hello, Shashank, are you able to listen to us? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, you gave us the feeling as if we are at New Orleans attending the conference yeah, physically. Yeah, Thank, you. Thank you so much. I have three questions for you. Question number one is, can semiglutide alone replace insulin therapy over a period of time with lifestyle modification and diet and exercise and replace the role of bariatric surgery also? That is question number one. Okay, it can replace insulin therapy over a period of time, right? Yes, if there is adequate C-peptide on board. Okay. So, the prerequisite for that is functioning beta cell. Okay. Second, Second question is, in adiposity-related diabetes mellitus type 2, can bariatric surgery alone be the treatment for diabetes with morbid obesity? No. No. Okay. Bariatric surgery is not physiological. It is more of a, uh, you know, cutting. See, first of all, bariatric surgery is not standardized. Some people do sleeve gastrectomy, some people do gastric bypass, some people do UNY, some people do ileal transposition. So there is no uniform procedure or a standard of care procedure. So it cannot so be the treatment for diabetes. No, no, no. Only in brittle diabetes, in occasional cases, it may be reserved as an option. But for me, with these new agents which are available, particularly agents like trazapatide coming up, semaglutide data coming up, there is no room for bariatric surgeons. Will be, it will be like after these agents are available like semaglutide, I think bariatric surgeons will be out of business. Okay. That is why the OMRS is now inviting them for all these meetings. Okay, last question is, in atherogenic lipoproteins, is it uh, that element alone or endothelial inflammation is also responsible for progression of atherogenous process? No, no, no. Therosclerotic lipoproteins, these are, you know, they have a liver pathway and intestinal pathway. So they are important, but endothelial dysfunction is equally important. So endothelium is the longest organ of our body. But endothelial dysfunction is more of a sequel in the process. Hello. Uh, congratulations, sir. I am Dr. Chetan Ankar. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, suppose a patient of chronic type 2 diabetes has gone in an uh, acute heart failure and his EF has uh, gone to 30%. Okay. So, uh, he is already on uh, dapagliflozin, liptin and all. So, if I want to start these oral semaglutide, uh, so how far it is safe and uh, better? Switch over, switch over, switch over, switch over, switch over, to uh, rebellious. Yeah, it's absolutely safe. There is no problem. 30% ejection fraction uh, on DAPA, if you want to add a top of all the semaglutide, it's absolutely safe. Achha. And uh, which gliptin uh, will be better uh, to switch over? Because no, most of I will not use a gliptin in a heart failure situation with the background of heart failure. Okay, even CETA also not. Uh, CETA no, no, that, that CETA may be a better option, but uh, otherwise I would avoid the lipid altogether. Okay, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, you said that uh, simple weight reduction is not enough. That is only BMI reduction is not enough. So, which is the best way to reduce weight? No, no, no. So, we should not be BMI sensitive. You are right. Uh, you should lose fat and lose fat. Uh, fat loss is more important. So, losing weight just by BMI is not important. But using fat and fat tissue and burning the fat tissue is equally important. So, your BMI may still remain the same. But if you have fat around your stomach and you are able to burn that out with the same BMI, that, that, that is more physiological. So, actually reducing your body fat is uh, in your composition is far more important uh, than just using uh, uh, reducing BMI. So all weight loss medicines actually burn fat. They are fat loss medicines, not BMI reducing medicines. So the old yardstick, the old yardstick used to be looking at weight and uh, looking at uh, uh, BMI. But that and paradigm of anthropometry should shift to body, body composition. How much fat have you lost? Sir, the other question is, uh, in Indian so patients... You can measure it also. So the, the way we measure bone density by DEXA mode in body composition scan, we can do a DEXA body composition scan, measure the percentage of body fat. 
Hello sir, uh, I am Dr. Samin Mansuri. Uh, you have just mentioned about the body fat scan which will help us to identify the quantity of uh, fat and the changes that take place. Does it also tell us about the quality of fat? Because you have mentioned in one of your slides that adiposity by definition now. Pardon? Quality and quantity of fat both, but that we know from the site. So if it is a visceral site or whether it is a site, so based on the site of the scan and the type of fat, we can make an indirect presumption because there is a regional body fat distribution. So what you are asking is a very relevant question. So if it is abdominal fat which is visceral compared to abdominal fat which is subcutaneous, we will. But the body composition scan or the dexa bone density scan doesn't differentiate. The subcutaneous tissue fat from the uh, the visceral fat. For that, you have to do MRI. So, so MRI. But these are research tools. MRI. Remember, these are research tools. These are not normal tools. These are all done in research setups. Uh, sir, one more question regarding the passive carrier in gestational diabetes. Could you please elaborate it further? As well, uh, regarding the passive carrier, you mentioned that in GDM there is a passive carrier in one of your slides. So could you Correct. please elaborate on it? No, no. no. So what happens is that GDM is basically not only on first the risk to the mother, mm -hmm. but and that mother developing diabetes later in life, but also to the child to be born, okay. it becomes a carrier for future diabetes. Oh, right. So that is what happened. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you so much, audience, for all the questions, sir. Uh, we do have around a thousand plus audience uh, watching virtually. Also, we have received. Uh, uh, questions from them. Uh, should I go ahead and ask those questions? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you so, so much, sir. So, so the first question is uh, with once weekly insulin coming up, so will it change the paradigm of diabetes management from now on? Completely. Because you see, it will change. So just like uh, when you move from HPH to glargine or from glargine to placebo, 
uh, you know, when we will have uh, I could uh, once a week, it will be a total game changer. And you can talk to who is doing the trials in India, and many of these uh, investigators who are doing the trial, if you talk to them, they will tell you that this is a complete game changer. Imagine giving it once a week. You know, just like you are giving. Uh, you heard a doctor asking once a week uh, he wanted to give Ozempic. Correct. Similarly, you know, once a week uh, will be a big game changer. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So we also have one question from Dr. Pramod Jha from Dhane. So he asked, uh, is Dikshit diet will help in adiposopathy management when recent ADA guidelines give importance to obesity management approach with uh, glucocentric approach in management of diabetes? There are much better diets than this, that diet which he is quoting. Uh, you know, these intermittent fasting like diets are not very successful. Uh, eating less on low calorie diets, on very low calorie diets are far more impactful than the non-physiological or intermittent fasting like diets which are there. And uh, we have now uh, much better artificial intelligence tools in which we can actually monitor it because now we have sensors, uh, CGM, so we can actually monitor all this in a much better and more physiological way. But the whole uh, paradigm has shifted now. Uh, we, 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 we not only monitor glucose, uh, or eating pattern, uh, physical activity, sleep, and beyond that we also monitor weight and BMI and body composition and fat loss. And sleep is equally important also. So I think it's a holistic approach. So rather than going for any of these bad diets, which may have their drawbacks, one would go for a more holistic approach uh, when you are approaching weight loss. But weight loss definitely helps. And when you have agents like uh, uh, ribelsis with you, uh, you know, you definitely are uh, in a better position to handle this. Thank you so much, sir. So this is the question regarding uh, uh, one of the award lecture which you have presented, the Norbert Frankel Award. So is the teratogenic risk is high even if uh, type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes are well controlled during pregnancy? Uh, so and also what is your opinion especially because we saw that uh, there is a huge difference in terms of the, the racial disparities yes so the teratogenic risk is not high if the a1c is well controlled okay. but the a1c and the fasting between targets in pregnancy are tight we try to keep the a1c below 6.5 preferably below 6 and the fasting below 90 milligram percentage and uh, the post prandial 120 milligram percentage but we try to keep the time in range. So keeping time in range and most of the time, time below range is not easy during pregnancy. So any glucose spike during pregnancy can be fatal, which is why we advocate early use of insulin. That's number one. And uh, the second question was? So the second question is the, especially we see that a lot of racial disparities are there. Yes. Uh, so, so there are two major races which are very prone and predilected to GDM. One, of course, is our race, which is Asian Indians. And in USA, it is Asian Indians and Pacific Islanders. And second is the Hispanic race. So there are many geographies and races which are more predisposed to gestational diabetes. Yes, sir. thank you, sir. So the next question is, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, insulin combination with uh, either a GLP-1 or uh, with the dual agonism that is GLP-1 plus GIP? So what's your thoughts on that, sir? So you want to have a triple, which means insulin with GIP with GLP. Yes, sir. That's the question they're asking. Your your opinion that, on that, sir. That, that also will occur. Ultimately, everything will get combined with insulin and insulin uh, will, will be reduced. See, people who need insulin will always need insulin. Correct. And if you get once a week insulin, you still need some basal insulin on board. See, remember, it is very difficult to control hepatic glucose production. Somebody is asking a question about glucagon. So that unabated hyperglucagonemia or the fasting or hepa excessive hepatic glucose output can be best controlled by basal insulin. And uh, then once you have a once a week insulin or you have a, uh, a, a Traceba or Isodec on board, you can easily control that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the next question is about uh, the oral insulin, that is the future of insulins that you spoke about. So do we need oral insulins when we are now having oral peptides available targeting multiple mechanism of type 2 diabetes? So and also if oral insulin comes, so how is the titration is going to be uh, <coughs> happening with oral insulin? Sir? So oral insulin is an enigma. It is not easy to handle oral insulin because they will take a long way to go. And uh, oral insulins will have their own challenges. So oral insulins uh, will, uh, you know, all the oral insulins have not made it to the market because, you know, the quantity required 
you know, in oral insulin is very huge. So commercial viability of that is poor. So currently, except the Tregopil and the Oramed, uh, which are in early phase two, phase three, nobody has gone there also. In fact, no also had their own program, but they also have abandoned. They have the best technology. In fact, the same technology only was used now for oral ribenses. If you see your current backbone of semaglutide, the yes, whole sir. derivation of that technology uh, has completely come from the oral insulin research they did, from the peptide team of Novo Nordisk. So clearly, we can see that we can utilize it to deliver other peptides in a more physiological way rather than insulin. Insulin still has been a tardy uh, exercise. Sure, sir. So, though we are getting a lot of questions on the online, so I'll take last two questions, sir, uh, considering the uh, the time here. So, uh, the other question is about, uh, again, the once-weekly insulin. So, with no additional risk, so do you think once-weekly insulin will replace the once-daily insulin injections which are there, sir? 100%. Okay. They'll completely replace, and that is the big game changer. Yes. Sir. Without fear. See, sure. people have this scare. Initially, doctors will be very scared that I have insulin for one week, so what will happen? You know? But that fear should be taken away. Sure, sir. So, the last question for today's session is, sir. So, considering the future availability of drugs like uh, semaglutide and also we saw with some amount of terzaptide, so could obesity will become a primary target in type 2 diabetes management and remission? Yes. It could be, it's one of the primary targets. Yes. That's what, what was the overarching theme that we are now getting into a, 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 a dual mechanism or a blend of weight loss with glucose control. So the overarching theme of my talk today has been that if you are managing a diabetic, uh, you need to manage glucose and fat loss simultaneously. Yes. Thank it's you so much. Diversity management. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I know that uh, you are not keeping well even then uh, since because of your commitment, you have decided to come virtual and also you have decided to uh, give your insights, especially on live and also address all our queries. Thank you so much, sir. So before we close this uh, session, uh, any final comments to the audience here and also uh, the participants who are attending through virtual, especially on the ADA 82 scientific session, sir. So I think, uh, uh, you know, the advances in diabetes are very rapid and quick. And uh, we have seen that uh, diabetes, uh, obesity and diabetes, their, their, their distinctions are blurred. And we have moved beyond um, uh, cardio uh, metabolic risk, uh, cardio renal risk now to weight loss and glucose control. So I think those are really the quadrant which, uh, which I summarize in the ADA ESD algorithm which is evolving now and which will be represented at the ADI at Stockholm. That's really the key. And we are getting new agents, which now we have available in India, like oral semaglutide. They'll be truly game changers. They, they will have more compelling data than even any SGLT2 inhibitor, which has been produced till date. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we wish you uh, 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 very good health and also take care of yourself and have a very good day, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, can we have a big round of applause to Dr. Joshi, sir? So I would also like to thank all the participants and the audience who have joined here uh, on live to listen to Dr. Joshi sir and also to those uh, who are attending through virtual platform. Uh, so we really appreciate uh, your patience and also we apologize for those technical glitches we had uh, as we know that uh, you know the COVID has definitely taught us to be in the virtual world and uh, so we are trying to be and we are trying to still adjust and absorb those technical dif difficulties. So with that uh, I would uh, thank all of you who are here. Uh, to attend this uh, 82nd uh, ADA scientific sessions which happened uh, from 3rd June to 7th June uh, 2022 at New Orleans, USA. Uh, I'm sure that one of the participants who said like, you know, we didn't have to be there because of Dr. Joshi sir talk, we could actually, uh, you know, uh, felt that we are actually attending the ADA session. So that's the, the power of uh, uh, Dr. Shashank Joshi sir's uh, uh, post ADA update and uh, uh, that's our commitment and we continue to deliver that commitment uh, going forward also so now uh, uh, now the meeting is adjourned so uh, the lunch is ready so uh, thank you so much once again and have a very uh, good day and have a great uh, Sunday too thank you so